what we're doing here is we're trying to inform you, communicate with you as a messenger of how to get to heaven, to live eternally with joy, happiness, and cheerfulness, and, and a great love. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go there to prepare a place for you. Lord God, I ask in the name of Jesus Christ that you bless us today with an understanding, open the eyes and ears and hearts of our understanding, that we may receive more of you this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. amen. Now, if you've been paying to worldly events uh, at, at all in this last uh, two or three weeks, since Putnam invaded, uh, whatever, huh? Ukraine. U Ukraine, thanks. <laughs> then you might kind of figure it out something by now. What's the ultimate threat? Nuclear warfare. That's the ultimate threat. That's usually made by someone who, well, in this case, has nothing else to lose. He has nothing to lose. Just like the mullahs in, in uh, Iran have nothing to lose. They're 70 and 80 years old. They have nothing to lose. Uh, what, if, they, if they go to heaven as martyrs, that means in, in terms of uh, receiving nuclear war on them, okay, because what they'll do is they'll start it first and then they'll receive it. Then they go to heaven as martyrs, they'll get 70 some odd versions and all kinds of, of good things that, that the natural man desires entirely, but are not of God. So it's all philosophy of the way we want to live your life. That's what we're doing here today. This is, there was a fellow named Jesus Christ who was responsible for what we're going to do today, okay, in terms of, of what we're going to read. He had a philosophy, a way of living, a way of life. We're going to read about it today. And it's yours to choose from. And what happens is all throughout the ages, everybody chooses a way of life to live. In other words, they say, I'm going to live my life want to. That's your way of life. And it probably corresponds to one of the doctrines, one of the philosophies of one of the one of the philosophers, because they got dozens and dozens and dozens of different ways as you can choose to live your life. This is the way I've chosen to live my life. You can live it too this way. And the reward for living it this way is a promise of eternal heaven. That's the reward. Um, the other philosophies don't really give you that. I mean, you know, uh, I, I, <laughs> Uh, in terms of, well, some, some provide, provide some type of nirvana, but uh, anyway, we'll just let that go. So today, we're taking into consideration the modern events of what's about to happen. And what is about to happen is actually nuclear warfare is going to come. It's going to hit us. Eventually, you can't have, like, I think it's 16 countries now that have nuclear bombs without somebody getting up one morning, not feeling too good, and psh, that's it. And it just takes one to start it, and then all the rest come. Okay. Now, the mullahs in Iran, they want nuclear bombs. I don't think they have them quite yet, but as soon as they do, they have promised over and over and over, they will kill you. They will bomb you in the United States of America and, and Israel. All right, Israel first, of course, then the United States of America, and just wipe you out. They hate you. And then, of course, they're old men, 80, 70, 80 years old. They know they'll get retaliated, but... What do they got to lose? Because their, their Quran says they'll go to heaven as martyrs. Well, got to, same way with what Putnam's going on. He's 69, he's going to be 70 in October. Okay. He's been, he's head of the K, was head of the KBG, JB. He's had everything in the world has to offer. Multi-millions of dollars, buying women and song, everything, power, prestige, everything. And he's at the end of his life and he knows he's going to die soon. So, What's his ultimate desire then? To rule the world. Okay, that's what he wants to do. Why not? He's done everything else. He's ruled Russia. Now he wants to rule the world. And he's starting now. And what if he can't get it? What if he gets stopped? Well, big deal. I'll just throw a few bombs out there. What's he got to lose? He knows he'll die. But you're going to die with him. And in that way, he'll have a victory. See, people don't see that. They just say, oh, this guy, he's taking over. No, no, he's, he's going for the, uh, his thing is world denomination. It's called the game of risk. If you've never played the game of risk, uh, it was quite interesting. It's nation, no, thought against, nation against nation, let's put it like that. 
uh, oh why? Just for possession, just to own. And that's what Putnam is, is, Putnam is doing now. And if he gets fails in this thing, if he fails, he's already told you what he's going to do. Well, he's going to do that. And if something else happens in between, and the Iranians actually get nuclear weapons, they're going to do it right just like that. And they're on the verge, have been on the verge of getting nuclear weapons for a number of years now. And I suspect, in fact, that they may well have them by now. And then we have Pakistan, and we have China, and we have uh, Korea, North Korea, and we have all going to be a mess. Here's what God said. This is a warning of immediate danger to you. This is a preview of what is to come for you. This is what the Bible says about this situation that we're now experiencing. This is what the Bible says. So let's read this now, shall we? Here's the prophecy. God made a prophecy. He said, this is, about, this is what's going to happen. And I'm going to read it now. I have it in Joel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. So I, what I've done is I've printed out in blackface the exact words of the Bible in blackface. And then, because I've got a lot of explanations, uh, uh, secondarily, I went and explained it in my second area there you can see. So let's look at the actual, what the Bible says. This is the prophecy now. Prophecy means it's going to happen. Okay? Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like. Neither shall be any more after it even to the end of many generations. Now that's kind of like, wow, what's that all talking about there? So whatever. So let's examine it now carefully. Joel chapter 2, verses 1. The first verse, we'll start now where I have the uh, uh, interpretations of myself and the Holy Spirit. You have to discern who's who. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Look back. Blow the trumpet in Zion means, in particular, the highest mountain in Jerusalem. It was called, Jerusalem is composed of, I think, three mountains, I'm not certain, but a number of mountains, okay? In fact, when I was flying into Jerusalem, it was kind of interesting. You're, flying, you're landing, and what happens is, you, when you land, you don't go straight across, you, you go down, and you go up, <laughs> up a, a, a hill, and, and, and down again. Well, that was back then, that was 50 years ago, so I don't know what's that. But anyway, blow ye the trumpet, that was, a, that was an aside, this meaningless aside, excuse me. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, particularly that, that's the highest mountain in Jerusalem. That's, Zion has, goes by two things. That's Jerusalem. Uh, that's another name for Jerusalem, but it's also a name for the highest mountain in Jerusalem. And that's where David and uh, his followers lived for a while. It's the peak, okay? And so, blowing the trumpet in Zion, in particular, particularly, that's the highest mountain in Jerusalem, is a type and shadow of Mount Sinai. Just like Mount Sinai, it's where God dwells. God dwells there, okay? And that also is, because it's the trumpet, it's the voice of the Lord. So now we're talking about the voice of the Lord. And this is an alarm, it says next, and sound an alarm. This is an alarm, I'm trying to alarm you. What was the title of today's message? A warning of immediate danger. This is going to happen soon. Immediate danger. Blowing the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm. An alarm means, in the Hebrew, it means make a joyful noise, shout for joy. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Well, who's going to supposed to be making a joyful noise in my holy mountain? That's you and I. If we are of the Lord, if we're saved and born again, that's us. Shout an alarm. Make a, make, shout for joy. Okay. And then it says this. It says, in my holy mountain, 
And then it says, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is at ha cometh. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. Now, that's now referring to the surrounding, the land that surrounds the holy mountain. Okay, that is Mount Zion. Which means, what surrounds Jerusalem? A whole bunch of land, right? A whole bunch of unsaved people. Yeah. Well, what surrounds, let's say Jerusalem is isolated, let's say isolated, let's say the rest of the world pretty much is, surrounds, surrounds the holy mountain, okay? In other words, that means it's not saved, unsaved, not born again people. So it says here, because that's important to realize the distinction of what's caused in one verse, a distinction. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. With all the inhabitants of the land, and that's the, that's the, the surrounding Mount Zion, the land surrounding Mount Zion that is not holy, not saved. Let all the, those people tremble. Because we're not going to tremble when the Lord comes. Are we? No, we're not going to tremble. We're going to be helping shouting for joy. But all the land tremble. What does tremble mean in Hebrew? It means quiver. And it's uh, parenthetically uh, in Strong's Concordance says this. Any violent emotion, especially with anger or fear, anger or fear, if you're unsaved and the Lord comes, whoa, you're going to respond anger and fear. The fear first, of course, and then anger, okay? It says here, uh, quiver, it means to quiver, any violent emotion, especially with anger or fear, to be afraid, quake, rage, shake. And there's some references in the book of Hebrews about shaking. The Lord's going to shake the world. So we're seeing a reference to two people there, two types of people in this one verse. Okay. It says here, Son of in my holy mountain, that's to save people. And the, right next to it, it has a colon that has, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. That's the unsaved people who surround the holy mountain. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Now let's look at what this is. Day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Day of the For the day of the Lord cometh. Prophecy now. What's it? First footnote says this about that. And look at that, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. It says this, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. Ignorant means, doesn't mean you're stupid, it just means you don't know. Being ignorant, okay? I'm ignorant of uh, speaking Chinese. I don't know how to speak Chinese, all right? But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Well, that's just, kind, of, kind of confusing. Let's read it with a little interjection there. Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. To us, to us it's as a thousand years. Okay? But to the Lord, a thousand years is as one day. So to the Lord, this is just, uh, like this. Our existence here is a, a thousand years of our existence means this to God. Okay? Got that? So we're talking about, it says, the day of the Lord. Could be a reference to a thousand years. Well, that's interesting. That's just a reference to a thousand years. Let's leave that sit for a while now, and let's continue. Okay, now we get to the second verse. Ooh, this is the biggie here. Here we go. It says this, and I'll read the verse. And you can look at the verse up on top where I have it in the hole. In fact, I'll read it from up on top, number two, Joel 2, verse 2. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong throughout not 
been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Well, if you look at that verse and think, this is all one verse, and it says, it says a, dark, a, a, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, and then it says, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, I don't understand what's going on. God's talking about two different kinds of people. He's talking about in one in the one verse, talking about saved people and unsaved people. Okay? Because remember, when the Lord returns, we're gonna shout for joy. But the unsaved people are gonna cower and tremble in shame and fear. Because they know destruction is upon them. So let's read this now again. Uh, now look at my notes and uh, to read it like this. Uh, a day that is a day for all unsaved people of darkness. A day. The first thing that day of the Lord is a day for all unsaved people. It's a day of darkness. And that means in Hebrew, the dark, it means figuratively misery, destruction, death, ignorance, sorrow, wickedness. I mean, that's the same thing as darkness in Genesis chapter uh, 1, uh, verses 1 through 5. Same exact word. A day that is for all unsaved people, a day of darkness, <coughs> misery, destruction, death, ignorance, sorrow, wickedness, and of gloominess. Now gloominess in, in the dictionary means despair, dismal, depressing. For the unsaved, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. That's thick darkness. Bad, 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 bad thing. So see, a day of the Lord is going to be that to some people. Is it going to be that, that way to save people? Think about it yourself. Absolutely not. It's the word to have joy. For unsaved people, that's the deal. Let's continue. Same sentence now, same verse, okay? It ends here in a, a day of gloom and a day of clouds and thick darkness. And now in the same exact verse, it means here, as the morning spread upon the mountains, and morning means in the, in the Hebrew means dawn. Now, when it's dawn, do we normally think of depression, miserable, destruction, death? We think of joy, happiness, delight, light. So now we got a contrast here, okay? It says in the same verse again, uh, 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 as the morning spread upon the mountains. Spread means spreading, spreading upon the mountains. In the morning, have you ever been out to the, at dawn uh, in the mountains or any, any place, actually? I looked out and watched, this, watched the sun come up the dawn, and the dawn come to light. And it's joy, happiness. It's, you know, is it warm or cold? It's warm, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Warmth comes upon you. Okay, Not cold, depressing, evil, hard, but warmth comes upon you. That's what's going to be for us. Great warmth. Okay, uh, uh, read really it here. As the morning and the dawn spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. Now, what does all that mean? So what does it mean, the great people and the strong? Uh, there hath not ever been the like. Well, I have a reference here. We're going to be, we're talking about the good guys now, and this time, that's us. It's a chosen, that's a quote from John 15, 16. A chosen people, Jesus Christ said, you've not chosen me, I've chosen you. That means the degree collected. He's chosen you. Okay, a chosen, you're saved and born again, you've been chosen, you've been chosen, okay? You've been chosen, you've been chosen, you've been chosen. I can go on, but. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a strong, a chosen people, okay, the chosen people are what? They're caught up, have been caught up. Caught up, that's a quote from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 17. They've been birthed, they've been born again, that's the rapture we're talking about now. That's the what, what boys and girls. When, when the, when the, when the, what is the rapture? It's great, it's great joy and delight. It's happiness and joy. We're going to be caught up. Okay, I think. Well, let's just continue here. It says here, a great people and a strong, and parenthetically I have a chosen John 15, 16, people caught up, and from 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, birth, born again. You see, the rapture is like a being born again, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You're here, you get raptured up, out of here. Just like coming out of the womb. 
you're in the womb here, and then you get raptured out as a, as a newborn. It's being born again. See? Now, that's from uh, uh, John uh, chapter 3, verses 3 and 7. talks about born again. 1 Peter 1, chapter 20, uh, ver, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 talks about as well. Okay, and I'm saying here, without the, without the scriptural references, uh, a people in the strong, a chosen people caught up, birth, born again, of the rapture. What is the rapture? It's the first resurrection. Think about it. If you're just all of a sudden here, and then bang, you're up there, okay? And it also says in that one, one seventy, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then that we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the air to meet the Lord in the air. That's the quote, okay? Dead in Christ shall rise first. Isn't that called a rapture? Yes. Isn't that that's crap? <laughs> Isn't it called a resurrection? Mm. When you're dead in Christ shall rise first, that's a resurrection, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and then. The, the, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. That means that they'll go up. It's a resurrection, you see. Okay, the rapture is actually a resurrection, and then we will go up too. The dead in Christ, I say a resurrection, the dead in Christ will go up too. Okay, that, and where's the first? And it's the first resurrection. There's two. This is the first one uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6, talks about the first resurrection. We're not going to participate in the, in the second resurrection. That's the second death. The Bible says we're not going to participate in that. We who are saved and born again, because we're going to heaven. But the unsaved are going to participate in the second death. What essentially means separation from God for all eternity. So reading that verse again. It'll be that day when the Lord returns. It shall be a day of, of uh, for the unsaved people of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. And then it continues and says, for the, uh, for the saved people, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath been, there hath not been ever the like. Why? Raised up people full of the Holy Spirit. That's called angels, my friend. Good angels. Full of the Holy Spirit. There's not ever been the like. And it says, that, how else does it say? Now, this is interesting. It says, there's not ever been the like. Neither shall be any more after it. Oh, after, but then it continues and say, after it, and then it qualifies it by saying this. Neither should be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Which means, well, there will be, but there's a period of time in between. A period of time in between, it says here, there hath not ever been the like of resurrected saints, like this, okay. Uh, and neither shall be any more after it, that for that's for a period of time, even to, that is, two means in, in the Hebrew, two means until until the years of many generations. What is that referring to? Well, let's think about it. I have here parenthetically, the generations from this beginning of the return of Jesus Christ, the return of our Lord, from this beginning until the end of the thousand year millennium. That's in the Bible. Until the end. So in other words, at the beginning of the thousand year millennium, uh, well, for what first is going to begin is we're going to have the rapture. We're going to be taken out. The Lord, Lord's coming back at the same time. What happens? <laughs> says, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 says, we'll, we'll rise up to meet the Lord in the air. What happens when the Lord comes back? Look at this. What happens when the Lord, here we are, here he is, when the Lord comes back? Notice that? We come back to what? To us. W what does 1 Thessalonians say? And we shall... Meet him in the air. He's coming back. We're going to meet him in the air. That's the rapture. See how it all ties in? And that's our first resurrection. Okay. And I'm not telling you things that figment in the future. That's like, oh, that's nice to know. Why do you think God's revealing this now? Because it's going to happen. Because it's going to happen. Here's the warning. What's the warning? You better be on the right side. That's right. 
when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Because he is also God coming back. And as he comes down, he return, we're going back up to meet him in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord, it says. That's about to happen. It ain't going to be happening, you know, five years from now or, or eight years from now or whatever. It's going to be happening. There's a reason for it about to happen. It's right on the edge. You see, God uses the things of this world for his own purposes. He doesn't do things directly in that, in that sense of the word, but he allows things to happen and he uses things in this world for, for his own purposes. Here's what's going to happen next. Well, let me continue though. It says, okay. Okay, it's going to be a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people will be strong. There, uh, there shall not ever be the like, neither shall be after, after it, even to the years of many generations. To get it now, the dichotomy between the two different groups. Okay, now what happens? Okay. Now let's go. We've left that. That's the warning, Joel chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. That's God giving us this warning. This is about to happen. This is not way up a thousand years from now when we got this. It's now. So all we have to do is look around and see it. Okay, so let's go look. Let's look at the day of the Lord now. Because this is what it talked about here. It said, this is, uh, 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 Joel says, uh, uh, for the day of the Lord cometh, okay, in, in uh, Joel chapter 2, verse 1. So let's look down at Zechariah and see what Zechariah says about the day of the Lord. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. I'll read those first strictly right out of the Bible, then we'll go for them. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and, there, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue shall not be cut off from the city. Well, that sounds kind of strange. Well, let's look and see what's actually happening here. This is Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. Now he's talking about it. First we got, we read it, the prophecy in Joel. Now we're going to read about the actual happening. Now so I'll read it now with my interjections. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and I have parenthetically now, cometh immediately as or after, immediately as or after the rapture. Because we're going up. When we go up, it's going to be, man, the people who are left are going to be in great tribulation. Because they're being, because the Lord's coming down, down. Okay, when we go up, all oh, let me look at it like this. It's like taking the Holy Spirit out, out of the world, because we all have the Holy Spirit in us. It'll be like taking, and, and uh, two Thessalonians talks about that. Okay, uh, strong delusion and so on. It's like taking the Holy Spirit out of the world. What's left? What's really evil people? Not evil as well. Evil, yes, but natural people. People who have not been converted, who remain as animals. Why do you think God created man and animals on the same day? And why did why did uh, God say in, in Ecclesiastes that He would He would uh, um, uh, hope that they would see they them, that they themselves are beasts? Talking God talk about the people that they themselves are beasts. B e a s t s. That's an animal. Before I was saved and born again. I was an animal because I did not have the Spirit of God in me. But once I got the Spirit of God in me, I, I, before I was walking on, on fours like, like this, I was an animal. Now that I have the Spirit of God in me, I stand up and I'm walking on two because I have this, I'm a man. I have the Spirit of God. I've been transformed. I've been changed. In effect, from butterfly, from from caterpillar to butterfly, caterpillar walking on the ground and uh, that would be metamorphosized into a butterfly. Mm -hmm. So have you. You just don't know it. If you've been saved and born again, you have God's joy inside you. God's joy lives inside you. 
you just are holding it back. You're just not, not containing oh, it. Because it wants to grow. It wants to expand inside you. But, oh, I still want to smoke cigarettes and I still want to do crack and, and drugs and I want to drink and I want to lie and cheat and steal because that's oh, funny and I want to do that. So you're holding back God's spirit from expanding inside you. You're the one. God will never, never overcome you. He says that. I will, he will never overcome you. He will, he's allowed you to make the decision. It's your life. You have to decide. Do you want to hold back to do this, that, or do you want to open yourself up to the Lord? Because you're going to come out of those bodies. That's final. No changes then. It says that. It says that in the book of Revelation. You'll be what you are. Do you want to be what you are now? <laughs> Some of you aren't saved. You better be changing. This is the warning. This is the warning. This is about to happen. This is your chance. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh immediately after, as or after the rapture, it will be close call, I can't tell which. Some persons will be coming back to the earth. First, we're going to be raptured up. Then we're going to spend some time learning, getting the fullness of the mind of Christ. I mean, he's going to, he, I see a time interval going on here, all right, to some, to some extent. And then we're coming back with the Lord. We're coming back with the Lord permanently for a thousand years. To rule and reign, the Bible says, for a thousand years. That's us. The Bible says, and kings and priests, it says that twice. And metaphorically, it says it three times. In the book of Revelations, we'll be as kings and priests when we come back. To rule and reign for a thousand years with the Lord. Here on this earth, why is the Lord going to do that, incidentally, a thousand years, millennium? So he can get converts. So he can, because how many people, listen to this. From about 1950 until now, this population in the United States of America has doubled. How many? Yeah, he's more than double, but let's call it double. Seventy years is. How about a thousand years? Well, how many people do you think can be born in a thousand years from now? Okay. Well, all those people are going to have an opportunity to be saved, become born again. They'll be born still in sin, but there'll be thousands of resurrected saints wandering around, preaching and teaching the word of God to them. That is you. For a thousand years. That's the millennium. And then, the end. God finishes it off. Then his army is fully formed at that point in time. After the thousand years, his army is fully formed. Because during, during that thousand millennium, lots and lots of people are going to read about that. They're not going to want to, not to do with God. Okay? Well, it says here, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, that is uh, coming back to uh, back to earth with the Lord. We will be back coming back to earth with the Lord, and sadly, many persons will still be here. All right. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil. And in, in, in the Hebrew, that means booty, plunder. Uh, and amplified has uh, shall be taken from you. Okay, for, who are still here from the unsaved people? All all your treasures and wealth is over the front. All that stuff's coming back to us. All that stuff that you got, that we're all fighting for to get. Hey, if you're saying the Lord again, you're going to get it. It's all coming to you. Okay, and thy spoil shall be divided, and, and, and Amplified has it among the victors, also uh, among the raptured, resurrected saints. The spoil will be divided among the raptured, resurrected saints. In the midst of thee, it shall be divided in the midst of thee. It's a, God, God confuses and says, For I will gather all. Nations, that means all unsaved nations. I will gather all unsaved nations against Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem here has an interesting derivation meaning. In the Hebrew, Jerusalem means dual, D-U-A-L. Well, what other kind of a, a, an analogy can you put to that duality? Because Jerusalem is supposed to represent all uh, Christians. But also, lots and lots of people in, in, in Jerusalem are not Christians. In fact, right now, I would say 98% of the people living in Jerusalem are not Christians at all. 
they're, they're uh, Orthodox Jews and whatever else. I think there's a lot of Arabians in, the, in there as well. That's present tense. It says here, for I'll gather all nations against Jerusalem. Do no, no, an allusion to what? To the church, because it's an allusion to what's happening. It's an allusion to what's happening in your mind. What is your mind? If you're saying the word again, you got two things, two lines of thought going on in your mind. You got God's thoughts coming into you, and you got Satan's thoughts that are coming into you still, that came into you originally. So you got two lines of thoughts coming in your mind right now. That's it. You're either thinking God's thoughts, you're thinking and actions, or you're thinking Satan's thoughts and actions. That's it. And one, if, if you have God's thoughts, he is overpowering, and he will continue to overpower Satan's thoughts in your mind. But if you don't have God in your mind, whew, man, you are in bad shape. Because you're going to hell. So that's the meaning of, that's, I get that reference from Jerusalem, dual, two, two minds, two minds, okay? So he says here, uh, uh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations, all unsaved nations, against Jerusalem, which is a, a uh, uh, means dual in the Hebrew, it means an allusion to the, of the, uh, to the church, that it's the believers and unbelievers. In the church, there are believers and unbelievers. Right here today, there are believers and unbelievers, okay? There are professing Christians and, and, and confessing Christians. Professing, I say I'm a Christian, but in actual fact, I'm not. The Lord, I may have some words of God in my, in my head, uh, but they're not going to last long. They're seeds. They're going to go out because Jesus never takes root in my body, never takes root in my mind. That's, that's uh, uh, I don't want to get into sore so with the seed thing, but, Okay. For I will gather all nations uh, against Jerusalem to battle. And the city, and we're now referring to, of the remaining left behind, unraptured, unsaved Jerusalem church persons. When, when the rapture happens, all the people who are Christian, who are actually believing Christians, could be raptured out. But what's going to be left behind is the multitudes of unsaved people. For I will gather all nations against, against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken. Shall be taken? But well, we won't be there anymore, okay? So the city shall be taken by whom? By whom? The, by, by what's happening right now? The evil. Bad people. Putnam, bad person. All the mullahs of uh, Israel, bad person. Uh, listen, I hate to say it. Uh, in all respect to the presidency, but i got to say that's, that's an evil person. And his presidency is evil. How do I know that? It's destroying the country. Literally destroying the country. Against all logic is what they're doing. No logic. See, that's the difference. The word of God is logos. That means logic, okay? Against all logic, we're being destroyed. Literally destroyed. Time after time after time after time after time. There's been absolutely not been ever in a year and a half Anything that has a positive effect upon the United States being done, it's entirely negative every single time. So whatever that man says, i got to say, man, that's going to get us into trouble now. And you know what? It does. But I have respect for the President of the United States of America. I respect the office. But you know, the Bible also says that God's in control. God's put those people in control. He put, uh, uh, how, could, how could destruction happen if you didn't have somebody like uh, the president in office to, to conduct it. Somebody had to do it. God put him in office. You can't look at it with emotion. you got to look at it logically. If you look at it with emotion, you're all done. You're in the wrong end of the, you're in the, wrong end of the line of thought. Okay? Okay, so it's just like like being addicted to something. You can't, you can't get over it. You just keep on doing it. Even though you may know inwardly that, that, that it's not good for you, you're still going to do it. No, I can't live with it. Okay. Now, again, this is my personal opinion. All right. 
and I could be wrong. So you have to consider it. All I'm asking you to do is consider what I'm saying. I'm not saying you've got to just immediately go change your whole life and do this, that, sort, and so on. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying, well, you better. No, I'm saying, <laughs> I'm saying it's up to you. That's my job. Messenger's not a judge. I'm not the judge. I'm the messenger. The judge is coming back, though. The righteous judge is coming back. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken. That's captured. That's the bad people that are left to be captured. That is the unsaved people of Jerusalem. And the houses, that's their houses, rifled. In the Hebrew, that means plundered. And the women, that's their women, shall be ravished. That means raped. Okay? And half the city... Let me ask you a question. Would God do that to his own people? No. Absolutely not. God says, well, we're not to suffer tri uh, tribulation. We're, uh, we suffer tribulation, but we're, we're not to, to, to suffer uh, God's wrath. This is God's wrath. Okay? Being allowed. What is God's wrath? That's Satan. That's God's wrath. He does it all. Yeah. And the women shall be raped, and half the city shall go forth, that is, go out, uh, out of the city, and what do they go out as? As unsaved slaves into captivity. God's not going to allow you guys, after this, after return of the resurrected saints, he's not going to allow you to, uh, 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 remaining saints, so let's say, or people who got converted, not going to go into captivity. But these people are, these unsaved people are going to go into captivity, and the residue, that's the remainder of the people, that's the unsaved servant slaves, because they'll be servants to, to their uh, conquerors, like put them, okay, shall not be cut off from the city. Why not? Because a city needs service uh, of the city functions. It needs water, lighting, heat, garbage, road. And so I say here, uh, it, shall, it shall not be cut off from the, the remainder of these unsaved people, shall not be cut off from the city. Because someone has to maintain the city, right? And how do you do that? They have to, so that they may service the city functions, the functions of water, lighting, heat, garbage, roads, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and service their personal masters, generation after generation, for a thousand years. Now here it is, ladies and gentlemen. Here's what we're going to expect, and I think we're going to be part of this. This is our rapture. And it's their doom and destruction. Thermonuclear war, which means atomic explosions. That's coming. Well, let's look at that. We see here first underneath that, the thermal means in the dictionary, temperatures of millions of degrees. The only way you can get temperatures of millions of degrees is nuclear. Okay? Just like our sun is temperatures of millions of degrees. That's nuclear. Our sun's nuclear. So our is this thermonuclear warfare, and I will point this out to you, Hebrews twelve twenty nine and, and two other places in the Bible. Three all together say this: For our God is a consuming fire. It appears twice in Deuteronomy and once here in Hebrews. Our God is a consuming fire. What does that mean? Our God's a consuming fire. Let me explain. Let me put it to you where you can see it. It's like being the sun, S U N. It's like being the sun. Millions and millions and millions of degrees, fire, heat, fire. That's our sun. That's also a type and shadow of our God. That's also a type and shadow of Jesus Christ, the S-O-N. The S-U-N is a type and shadow of the S-O-N, sun. Millions and millions of degrees, and he's coming back. And here's what he's going to be looking at, thermal nuclear warfare. Here's Zechariah chapter 14. Now, we just read Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to skip a lot, and I'm going to Zechariah chapter 14, verse 12. One verse. Thermal nuclear warfare is what we're going to be talking about. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. That's the only thing, and I've seen this uh, on uh, television, it's, it's, it's like gone. 
just like shoo, gone, consume away, consume away. So let's go back and read this uh, uh, with the uh, 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 meanings here. And, uh, and this shall be the plague. And the plague in the, Hebrew, in the Hebrew means a pestilence. Okay, by analogy, it means defeat. It means slaughter. And this is the thermonuclear radiation. Wait a minute. Because this is worthy of, if I could just find a good piece of chalk. <laughs> if this is worthy of. This is a good piece of chalk. All right, I found a good piece of chalk. <laughs> it makes me happy. I've been working with so many pieces for a couple months now. <laughs> okay. All right. And this shall be the plague. Pestilence. Okay. Plague is a pestilence in the Hebrew. By analogy, a defeat. By analogy, a defeat, a slaughter. That's all in the definition, the Strong's definition. Okay. Let's look at footnote number one on the uh, on the back. Pestilence. What does pestilence mean in the Hebrew? Well. Uh, I, I got it in the Hebrew. Now let's look and see what it means in the dictionary. In the dictionary, the first definition of pestilence is any virulent, virulent or fatal, fatal, contagious or infectious disease, especially one of academic, epidemic proportions, as bubonic plague. So now look at stop and think about this one. We're going to talk about radiation now. Radiation. Any vir virulent or fatal contagious or infectious disease, especially one of epidemic proportions. That's what we're talking about, academic, epidemic proportions, okay? Now let's look at the second footnote. Anything as a doctrine regarded as harmful or dangerous, that's a plague, okay? Now I, I also have here uh, in this thing that it's, let's look at what radiation sickness is. Footnote A in the back. Radiation sickness. Dictionary. Because I'm telling you, this is the plague. Dictionary. Sickness produced by, by overexposure to radiation as from x-rays or atomic explosions and characterized by nausea, diarrhea, bleeding, loss of hair, and increased susceptibility to infection. That's radio. What do you do? He gave you some joy. Oh, boy, what a nice guy he yes, is. He, <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Okay. Now, what do you expect uh, from, if we have a nuclear, uh, nuclear uh, 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 bombs, okay? Atomic explosions come down. They destroy everything immediately. But the radiation is what really destroys things. It spreads out. With, let's say if, if you bombed, let's say, St. Petersburg, for example, well, uh, with, a, with a nuclear bomb, well, all of St. Petersburg and probably Largo uh, uh, would be gone. But what the real harm is, the radiation that goes out for like 20 years or so, for years and years and years, harmful radiation goes out like a plague, like an epidemic, epidemic disease. That's what we're talking about, radiation. That's coming. That's what will kill you. Like, for example, we're, we're here in St. Petersburg now. We're about uh, 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 20 miles away from uh, Tampa. If Tampa were to be hit by a nuclear bomb, it would take care of all of Tampa for sure. But, but uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't, I don't think, directly destroy this, the cities and town of St. Petersburg. But the nuclear radi radiation would. The radiation coming through would go and it has a half-life, and I forgot now, I didn't even bother looking up the half-life and how long it lasts, but it lasts for years. Can't live. We die. Well, that's called plague. Well, that's what the Bible's talking about right here, a plague. Let me read it again. Radiation sickness. Sickness produced by overexposure to radiation as from x-rays or atomic explosions characterized by nausea, diarrhea, Bleeding, loss of hair, and increased susceptibility to infection. That's it. So, 
Now we know what a plague is. It's a pestilence, okay? Thermonuclear radiation. And let's read this again now from Zechariah chapter 14, verse 12. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite, that is slay in the Hebrew, all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. That's all the unsaved people. Their flesh shall consume away. What is our God? Our God is a A consuming fire. God uses the things of the earth to do his, his work. Like he's using you and me. But he uses the skies and the clouds and the mountains and, the, and the, everything he uses. Because he created everything. He's using everything to his work. Why do we have Satan? Satan is there. Actually, the reason we have Satan is to make us stronger. Because God originally created us all innocent angels. We didn't know anything about sin at all. And two-thirds of the angels are still up there, still don't know anything about sin, except the Bible says they look upon us with wonder. But we, who have been, are fallen, know all about sin. And some of us are going to be restored back up. And we'll have knowledge of the sin that the other angels don't. Well, who do you think God's going to send his missionaries out into all the universe? John, uh, 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 Mark 16, 15. Jesus Christ said go, to his disciples, go into all the universe, all the world, he said, which is in uh, cosmos in the English, and preach the gospel to every creature. Who's he going to send? The innocent angels who don't know anything about sin? Or the ones who do? The restored angels he's sending out. That's combat troops. So the innocent angels, just two-thirds that remained in heaven, those are support troops. And the one-third that fell with Satan, some of them, not all of them, probably a few, but some, are going to be restored and be combat troops. Gideon's, Gideon showed a, proportion, a great proportion of the 10,000 people that were saved in Gideon's army. 9,700 were support troops and... 300 were combat troops. But that's how the division is. You are supposed to be the combat troops. Now, you're not always going to be that. Some of us are going to be support troops and combat troops, the way I see it. But everybody who saved the morning again, everybody is going to serve the Lord forever and ever and ever. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go there to prepare a place for you. This is a good thing, serving God. Now, if you'd have told me that before I got saved, that, oh, you can go serve God, I would say, you idiot, what are you, what's wrong with you? Get out of get away from me. I would have said a lot more than that, but that was me. me. <laughs> but now I understand it. Serving, is serving God a good thing or a bad thing? Good thing. Well, you would think so, but if you're unsaved, you think, that's a bad thing. I don't want to do that. I want to serve me. See, because you still don't understand the you because you is not you it's Satan because you're thinking Satan's thoughts because he's the God of this world the Bible says you're thinking Satan's thoughts you're unsaved that's all you got Satan's thoughts period and you think you're doing you but <laughs> you're not you're doing his work yeah. there's only two way two philosophies of, of eternal life exist God's way or Satan's way. Period. That's it. Because you were created by God. And why do you think God created all those innocent angels uh, when he first created the heavens and the earth he created all those innocent angels? Why did God decide to create bad angels too? Because he did decide to do that, you know. That just didn't happen by accident. The Bible says in Isaiah, I think it's 45, 7, God created the evil. God created evil. Well, why do you think God created evil? He's got all these beautiful, innocent angels about him, and he created evil, and Lucifer got, it, got caught it. Well, why did God, why did God, see, you're here for a reason. You actually have been chosen by God to be here. You have been chosen by God. 
You know, that accidentally, uh, uh, when you drop, I tripped and fell, and now I'm, I'm in the earth. Now. You've been chosen by God to be here. Out of the angels, he selected you to believe Lucifer, who became Satan. You've been chosen to be here because God's trying to form you into an army. You're, this is boot camp. This is where you start boot camp. When you join the military, you start boot camp. You're in the army of God, and this is where you're supposed to learn <laughs> God's ways. That's what you do in boot camp. You learn all about the policies of the army that you're serving. But you serve. What I did when I got saved, when I got saved, when, when I got, well, I did the same thing when I got saved. But when I joined the military, what I did is I had to raise my hand and say words that they told me to say about my service to uh, the land, uh, the United States of America. I still believe that. I'm a patriot, for sure. I'm serving the United States of America. But on top of that, I've also pledged allegiance to God, and I'm serving God. And I'm serving God forever and ever and ever. And you can too. That's joint happiness. Here, there it is. I laid it out for you in the beginning. You want uh, misery, death, ignorance, sorrow, and wickedness? You got it. That's what you already got. Now, you want the happiness, joy, and peace, and happiness, and uh, uh, eternal love with God? You can get that if you want to. But you have to decide which army you want to join. You're already in Satan's army. You want to decide you got to leave Satan, and you got to go, and, you got to go on, on, follow Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you're going down the tubes, because where Satan is going, the Bible says, in a burning lake of fire. And all his angels go with him. Notice, notice what it says. Didn't say about people. It says Satan and his angels. All his angels go with him in a burning lake of fire. Well, who's an angel? We are. We're fallen angels. We're Satan's angels. If you're walking in sin, you're a fallen angel. You're going to the lake of fire with, with Satan. We burn forever and ever and ever. A little digression there. Hopefully an education. Look at this. This is what happens now. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite and slay all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away. In the Hebrew that means melt. It means figuratively to flow, to vanish, dissolve. Their flesh will dissolve. Flow, melt. Their flesh will dissolve when? Instantly. While they stand, out, while they stand upon their feet. That means poof. Just like that. It doesn't mean, oh, they lay down and then it just slowly dissolves away. It means, pow, gone. That's nuclear bomb, blast. And their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. What can do that? Millions and millions of degrees of fire, heat, can do that. And their eyes shall consume away. Again, melt, figure to flow, vanish, dissolve in their holes. And their tongue shall consume away. The whole thing. Took us away. Is, is, is he making his point here? That means melt to flow to vanish dissolve in their mouth. Now, let's look at footnote number two. The New Testament has it here too. This is what's about to happen. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 13. But the day of the Lord, we're talking about the day of the Lord now, will come as a thief in the night. That means without warning. A thief comes without warning in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, that is a, a, a great de detonation, an explosion, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. That's what bo nuclear bombs do, they explode. But with a great noise, a, a denotion explosion, and the earth, the earth, the elements, the earthly elements shall melt, and, the, and that's Greek uh, 30, because he uses that repeatedly here. Melt means to loosen, that because they're together now, they're going to be loosened, to be destroyed, dissolve. And the elements shall dissolve with fervent, that, that means uh, intense, vehement heat to be set on fire. The earth also and the works, that's the uninspired works that are therein, shall be burned up, consumed wholly in the Greek. Consumed wholly in the Greek. Seeing then that thou, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, and again that means loosened, it means destroyed, melted, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation? In the Greek, that means behavior and godliness, 
looking for and hastening. Now that's interesting. What's hastening mean? Because we're supposed to be looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of the Lord. Hastening means, and it means to use speed. It means awaiting eagerly. What we should be waiting eagerly, and I am. I'm waiting eagerly for the Lord to return to get us out of this mess that we're in. Me and you, not just me alone, but me and you, to save us, to take us up. That's what we're waiting for. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming day of the Lord, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, nuclear blasts, with fervent, that means intense, vehement heat, and that is set on fire, it means uh, uh, fire, with, uh, for, uh, with fervent heat, millions and millions of degrees, that's what it is, nuclear uh, thermal, uh, uh, nuclear warfare, war means temperatures of millions of degrees. Not just like, what is it, this morning was so 40, deg 40 degrees here and we were cold. And it maybe go up to 75 today, which would be nice. How about, how about uh, millions of degrees? How many, uh, how many numbers do you have? Let me just do this. Let's say it goes to 70 degrees today. Just to give you an idea of this degree thing, okay. Seventy degrees today. What's millions of degrees mean? It means this. That's what it's like in hell. Yes, it means millions of degrees. Because your flesh will psh, consume away. That's coming. That's coming. If not by Putin, then by somebody else real soon. Real soon. And the heavens shall be on fire that's dissolved with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. What he's saying here is we're looking to the whole deal is going to be burned up and we're going to get a new heavens and a new earth. And there are only going to be saved people on that, on that particular, mm, I'm not even sure I would call it a planet, but I'm just saying that, that particular space, only saved people, that's only righteousness, okay? Very nice. So, what does that mean? Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 14, we're look at Zechariah, what he's saying. Well, he continues so. Zechariah 14, verse 13 through 15. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them. That's among the unsaved. A tumult means confusion. Hebrew means confusion, trouble, vexation. I mean, it comes to the word, it means to agitate greatly. That's called great tribulation. We go up. Ah, all this holiness is gone from the world. What's left? Animals. Human animals. Great tribulation. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them. And it, for example, strong delusion, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11, the great tribulation, Matthew 24, 21, and they shall lay hold everyone on the hand of his neighbor, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor, and Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the heathen, that's the unsaved persons, Round about shall be gathered together gold and silver and peril in great abundance. That's what it's all coming to us, okay? And so shall be the plague. What is the plague again? The plague is in Hebrew a pestilence by analogy, defeat to slaughter, thermonuclear radiation. And so, and so shall be the plague of the horse and of the mule and of the camel and of the ass and of all the beasts that shall be in these tents, in the tents of the unsaved. That means everything that they own is going to be gone. Everything. I said it shall be indicating, why indicates widespreading radiation. 
Why spreading radiation? What do you mean? Oh, she'll be in these tents. All right. Well, the next one says a little bit about that. Okay. I just read you. Let me just for a moment uh, clarify. I have to clarify my nose. <laughs> and a few people escaped on me. That's okay. If you can't take it, you have to leave. That's up to you. I can take it. You can go with me or you can go with Satan. You, your choice. Okay. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 13 and 15. No, I got just did that. So we just talked about what's going to happen. Now we're going to talk about everyone that is left. Everyone that is left now after, after we're gone and the atomic warfare, the hydrogen bombs, nuclear blasts occur all over the, the world. Zechariah 14, uh, verses 16 and, uh, through 19. This is continuing right after what we just got read. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem, that's all the unsaved people, shall even go up from year to year to worship the king. Now it is during the thousand year millennium. From year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. That's the, that's the Feast of Fruits. I'm not going to get too deep with that. That's the end time feast, the seventh feast is the end time feast. And it shall be that those, that whosoever will, will not come up of all the family, in other words, won't come to church, of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, King Jesus Christ, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. Now he's talking literally and figuratively here. If you're literally getting no rain, okay, you can't grow any crops. Bad. You can starve, okay? But spiritually, no rain. Rain comes from heaven. It's God's word. No rain here, okay? So those who, who refuse to come to the tabernacle of Moses, who refuse to come to church, okay, there be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague. Ooh. And the plague comes again. A pestilence by analogy defeat or thermal nuclear radiation. That's the plague going to come upon them. That there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen, that's the unbelievers, that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, that don't come to church. This shall be the punishment of Egypt. That was the land of the unsaved, as you recall. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And now consistently, let's go to, in that day, this is the last part of Zechariah, this is Zechariah chapter 14, consistent now with these verses now. I've been reading from Zechariah 14, verses 13 now through 21, but it's been broken up. Now, in that day, the last segment, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 20 and 21. In that day, in that day of the Lord, when he's ruling and reigning for a thousand years, there shall be bells of the, of the horses. And that means, uh, bells in the Hebrew means tinklers. That means uh, perhaps indicating a return to an agrarian society. Horses. No gas, no oil, no electricity. Like it was 2,000 years ago. An agrarian society. Farmers. And what does the Bible say about God? Uh, John 15.1. Uh, God, my father is a husbandman. That means it means farmer. And now we look here. What's going to happen in that day? This is this is after after the thermonuclear warfare. In that day, there's that's now during the thousand years of a millennium. There shall be bells uh, uh, of the horses that, uh, that tinkling. That means perhaps indicating the return into an agrarian society. And they're taking holiness unto the Lord, holiness unto the Lord, holiness unto the Lord. And the pots, and that is, now the best I can put this is for, for small sacrifices in the Lord's house, where they would bring in small sacrifices in small pots, and they had large sacrifices in large pots, like meat and food and flour, and, and uh, they would bring uh, uh, fruit in and so forth and so on. They put them in pots, in containers, okay, to hold them. And the pots, that's uh, the pots for the small sacrifices in the Lord's house, shall be like bowls, huge, 
for large, large sacrifices. Before the altar, what is the sacrifice you're doing? Let me tell you a sacrifice you're doing. It's all been about sacrifices all the way through. Old Testament, they took, they, they sacrificed their, their animals and their, their wheat and their flour and, and all the all the things. They take them into the temple, uh, the ta tabernacle or the temple, and they would sacrifice them. Well, in the New Testament, what do you sacrifice? Well, I sacrifice cigarettes, okay? I sacrifice stealing and lying and cheating and all those Everything that God doesn't, doesn't approve of, I sacrificed or tried to sacrifice. And I'm attempting to sacrifice. I'm not pure by any means. I'm a sinner still. I've still got sin in me, just like you. But I'm sinning less and less and less. You should have seen me 40 years ago. Whoa, different deal entirely, different guy. I was a man of the flesh. Yea, every pot, this is now, during that thousand year reign, yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And all they that sacrifice, because we're talking about sacrifices, all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them. In other words, take, uh, take of them and seethe therein. That means to take of them, take what's in the bowls and pots, and they did before too as well. See, that, that, a sacrifice is like a donation. We're receiving here a donation. We call them donations, but they're actually sacrifices. People send money to me. Sometimes it's very, very dear to them. They still send it here for, for you folks, okay? It's a sacrifice on their part, but it's a donation. We call it a donation. And what happens? You come and you take it. You take food from here, you take clothing, you take, uh, uh, some people st steal from us. Uh, but, you know, that's understandable because the Lord said, uh, he, and both times he visited, the, in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he went into the temple and he cleansed it of the money lenders and, uh, and all, the, all the thieves and robbers that were there. And then for three and a half years later, he went into the temple the second time at the end of his ministry and he cleansed it again because he didn't get them all out the first time. We got the same thing here. I got 20 people on staff. I got thieves and robbers and liars and cheaters and all kinds of things on staff, okay? because they don't know any better. So you don't have to understand it. You can't judge, you just have to understand. They don't know any better. If they knew the difference, <laughs> if they knew God, if they, uh, the depths of God, the love of God, they wouldn't be doing that, but they don't know. Well, how come they don't know? Let me tell you why they don't know. Because they don't read the Bible, God's word. And think about it. And meditate. That's what Joshua was to do. He was to meditate day and night, the Bible says. They don't read God's word. Because they know them. I change. I like doing drugs. I like cheating and stealing and doing this and that. Or doing what I want to do when I want to do it. I don't want nobody in authority over me. Okay? You got it. You got exactly what you want. You don't want anybody in authority over you? We can even call you a Democrat. Okay, which is pretty much how they are. They're all working according to their own profit, not for the country's profit, their own profit. That's why they're doing what they're doing, lying to us all the time, cheating, stealing, everything. Okay, as compared, not generally speaking, not all Democrats, but most of them, as compared to Republicans who are by and large saved people, Christians anyway, professing Christians. And that's why we can't do what they do. They lie, cheat, and steal to us. We can't lie back to them and cheat and steal because we have authority in our lives. They don't. What's the difference? In the end, them having no higher authority, they're going down the tubes. They're going to hell. In the end, we having a higher authority are going to go join our master in heaven. Which do you want? Heaven. Which do you want? You want to go ahead and continue to do, I, I lie, cheat, steal, I'll do this, that, so I'll smoke this and crack and I'll get drugs and I'll drink and I'll do this and whatever I want. To be at it. Because God's given you a choice. And the reason for it is, is he knows that those who overcome that problem that they have, because we all had that same exact problem, those who overcome it are getting stronger and stronger and stronger in the Lord. That's the idea. God wants an army, okay? 
You don't, when you go to basic training in the military, you don't just go sit in the classroom and learn about policy. You go out and you do push-ups, you do run, you jog, you do this, you jump over stuff, out for courses. You do things to make you stronger. That's what God wants from you. He wants you to be stronger. That's why you're facing all the obstacles you are in your life. He wants you to overcome those obstacles. He wants to be stronger. You look at the book of Revelation, what's it talk about? It talks about overcomers. Overcomers. Overcomers? What do you mean overcomers? Overcoming what? You have to overcome your own self. You have to overcome your animalistic natural desires. The desires of the flesh. You have to overcome that. You have to be strong to overcome that. If you're not strong enough to overcome that, you're going down the tubes with Satan. And those of you who are strong enough to overcome it, are overcoming on a daily basis, getting stronger and stronger. Every time you say no, first time somebody offers you something, you go, oh yeah, I'll take that, it's free, a little bit ahead of this, that, whatever. But well, yeah, it's free. Huh? And then they, a little bit more, you had to pay for this, that. Yeah, 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 so and so on. But what happens when you first say no? No, you start thinking the first time you offer you, offer you, offer you, oh, you want some more, you want some more, Charlie? Uh, well, I, uh, uh, yeah, I have a little bit more. The second thing, you want some more, Charlie? You know you shouldn't, but you say, yeah, yeah, I'll have another one. And I'll well, just a little one. And then, you know, but then the third time, you say, uh, no, I, no. I go, ah, you said no. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's the Bible. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You said no. Fourth time it comes, well, you want some more? Or you, no. So I'm getting stronger. Fifth time comes, you want some? No, I don't want anymore. See how strong? I'm getting stronger and stronger and stronger. I have become, what have I done? I have overcome the sin, that sin in my life. I've overcome it. Now I still got it. You tell me I don't want to get laid. You tell me that I don't want to sin. I don't want to do drugs. I don't want to do alcohol. You tell me I, I don't want to do uh, lie, cheat, and steal. Certainly I do. But do I? No. I'm overcoming. I'm overcoming. Now, does it mean I'm perfect? No. Sometimes I slip. I might. I don't know. But I'm overcoming. Because I'm an overcomer. What does that mean? Look, look, at me, look for me in the book of Revelations where it talks about overcomers. That's where I'm at. Are you there? Are you there? Are you there? Or are you just reading something over oh, whoever they? I don't care about that stuff. Huh? Or do you even know what I'm talking about? I'm there in the book of Revelation. I'm an overcomer. Are you an overcomer? And I'm not perfect, but I'm still doing it, and I'm still trying. And I don't succeed every single time. In a, in a war, you never win every battle. You lose battles, too. Mm -hmm. But you keep on fighting, and you will win. That's right. So I'm winning more battles than I'm losing. And I'm going to keep on winning more and more. Yep. You can do it, too. But here we're talking about which one of these guys do you want to be when the Lord returns? You want to be one of those all in happiness and joy? Or you want to be one oh no, God, leave me alone. Because either way is permanent. There are no second chances. He's not going to come back and say, now I've given you, a, I'll give you another chance. No, no, he already gave you a second chance. What's your second chance? Your second chance is to be redeemed. Yeah, he kicked out of heaven, but then he gave you a second chance to get back. You want to get back or not? Because if you don't want to get back, not a problem. Not everybody's going back. Most of the angels, I think, that were kicked out of heaven ain't going to make it. It's like getting in the military. When you're in the military and you're going through basic training, some of those guys don't make it through. They get kicked out for one reason or another. They don't make it. you got to be strong. you got to listen and believe. And if you don't listen, you're all done. You put you plug up your ears and don't want to hear, you're all done. Write it up. Enjoy yourself. Your time is very short. You live, you'll die, and that'll be the end of you. I'll never hear about you again in my entire existence. That's what the Bible says. When we go to heaven, we'll all be in happiness and joy. What does that mean? 
There isn't going to be anybody in heaven. I'm not going to be able to remember anybody in heaven that I know that is not in heaven. Because if I remember that, if I remember like John down the road, who, and I'm in heaven, and I realize John didn't get saved, man, I would be an unhappy guy. There's one, one still suffering. What the hell? I'd be happy. So what God did, he clears all, all, that, all that stuff out. All that, that's called sin. All gone. So what happens here in the end, okay? This is the end is what it says. And that day shall there shall be bells on, uh, of the horses hoeing us unto the Lord, and the pots of the Lord's house shall be like bowls before the altar. Yea, and every pot, every donation, everything in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be hoeing us unto the Lord of hosts, and all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them, as us, of the pots and the bowls, and seed as boiled, baked, roast, sodden, cook, will take of them. That's us, for us now, okay? And so see there, and in that day, here it is now, final word, God's final word. And in that day, there shall be no more Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. And now he's talking about the Canaanite being an unbeliever in the house that's a church, practically speaking, of the Lord of hosts. In that day, that thousand year millennium, I may have misspelled that, but oh. <laughs> notice this. Have you ever seen that before in Scripture? In that day, there shall be no more. That means never. No more Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Now, I have Canaanites in here sitting here today, and I have Canaanites in my staff. And every place you're, now, I'll you know, tell you something about that. I keep criticizing my staff. I'm, I'm more correcting my staff than anything else because it's impossible. Listen, I had a lot of businesses before I came, before I became saved and born again. All my, all my businesses had unsaved people. They all did the same thing as my staff. They lied, they cheated, they stole, they did this, that, so on and so on. They all did all that stuff, okay? And it's the same thing that's happening with my staff today because they don't understand. Who are they hurting? Who's the lesson? Jesus went for three and a half years with a fellow named Judas as one of his disciples. Now he knew that Judas was a thief and a liar because he was, Judas was in charge of the treasury on top of it. And he was a thief and a liar and he was stealing money. But did Jesus kick him out? No. I got that in my staff now. But I'll have that in any church I go to in the, in the United States of America, uh, people, perhaps the majority, who are liars, stealers, thieves, whatever. Because why? Because they don't understand the difference. They do not understand God. Why don't they understand God? Take it. Because they don't read the Bible. I didn't understand God until I read I didn't read the Bible until I was 40-some years old. I was walking around doing all those things for me. I don't need anybody. I was, uh. And then I sat down one day and read the Bible, and all of a sudden I realized there is a higher power. His name is God. Now, how does God establish the thousand year millennium? He has thermonuclear warfare. He comes, he returns, he is the thermonuclear warfare in effect. Okay? Millions of degrees of heat. Radiation. That's what we're talking about here, radiation. Not only the explosion at first, but then the radiation. That's coming. If you can't see that, you are blind. No, I shouldn't say that. You are ignorant. Ignorant is not a nasty word. Ignorant means you just don't know. Yeah. I know because I've been reading the Bible I've been following what happens in the world according to what happens in Scripture, and it's right there before my eyes. And it's there before your eyes if you want to read it. What do you think it says? 
And if you think it's a bunch of hooey, oh man, are you ever, <laughs> there's only one way to go through this world, the right way, and that's God's way. Yep. Everything else you do and every other style of life that you try to conduct, pleasing yourself is all you're doing is you're pleasing Satan. And it's up to you because what's going to happen very soon, this whole thing is going to occur, okay, and there shall be no more Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. It'll be cleansed. Now, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you all this stuff, we're talking about all this stuff, which is a, a lifestyle. It's a way of life. It's not a hedonistic. A hedonistic is a type of philosophy where you do everything that, that makes you happy. That's in a self-centered philosophy that what most of us are going through. I was going through that myself. It's called hedonism, okay? Where everything you do is, make, is for you to make yourself happy. I know lots of people still who are like that because they're the authority, they think, of their lives, not realize that actually they're under Satan who's directed them. They don't get it. They don't get all these thoughts that they have in their head are hey, unclean spirits. They're influ influencing you, trying to influence you. Demons, we call them, unclean spirits, fallen angels, more. Influence, influence, influence. I got them too. It's like bugs. <sighs> Can't get rid of them, the bugs. <laughs> ah, yeah. But eventually, you're either going to overcome them or they're going to overcome you. Mm -hmm. So what do you want to be? Because in the book of Revelation, it don't talk about unsaved people getting all this good stuff and this, that, so on and so on. It talks about overcomers. Who are you overcoming? You're overcoming your own self, your own thoughts. You're overcoming them and you're accepting God's thoughts as your thoughts. You become an overcomer, a warrior for the Lord. And it keeps on testing you to make you stronger. And what happened in, in, in the Old Testament, in Exodus, uh, there was a day when uh, uh, there was a new pharaoh in Egypt, a new pharaoh in Egypt, he was an Assyrian, but there was a new pharaoh in Egypt who did not, who looked around and he said, all those, all those Jews living in the land of Goshen, a couple million Jews out there, oh, if they get together, they can really give us a problem. They were servants at that time, but he's thinking if they ever get together, they can come against us and cause problems. So he put them to work, hard work. He had, they had to make buildings with, uh, without straw. Uh, the, the bricks that they made, uh, they, see, a straw is what holds the, the bricks together. They had to make, uh, make buildings without straw. And they built uh, treasure cities, uh, Ramsey and some other, some other one they built for him. And uh, they were his slaves. But he came against them, he made them hard bricks. And the Bible says hey, they had, he put them to work with rigor, R I G O R. What that means. Hard work, trying to distract them to get them to get them working to weaken them from thinking about the, thinking about uh, uh, coming against Pharaoh. And what happened is, after Pharaoh did that, and he had all these all these Israelites building these things and trying to distract them from becoming their own army, what he did is he looked about them. And he said, he said, the more I flick them, the more they multiply and grow. Key, key message to you. The more you're afflicted, the more you will multiply and grow. That's what God's allowing to happen to you. That's like what he did, that's what he did to, to um, Job. He, Satan come against, come against Job and says he took this away from there and said, God, go ahead and do it. Take this. He killed all his kids and took all, he was the richest man around. He took everything from him. And then he still, Job was still not, pay, not paying attention to, Job, to Satan. So then Satan come again to Job and says, well, he wanted more. And God said, well, you can do what you want to with Job. Hurt him physically and do this, that's all right. But you can't kill him. And that's why you're still alive. Because God said that of you. You're going through all kinds of misery right now, just like Job went through. You got problems. This and problem we eat. We're going to sleep. We're going to this that. You got pains in your body. This thing's happening. That's happening. All these people are mad at you. You're mad at them. So all kinds of tremendous problems uh, in your life here. Okay, because why? Because you're being afflicted. How can you know why you're being afflicted? Because God's allowing Satan to do that to you. Well, why is God allowing Satan to afflict you? So that you will 
overcome that affliction and multiply and grow. That's why. God's looking out for you. Otherwise, he'd take you out. Useless. He'd take you out. But he's left you here and he wants you to be afflicted, 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 so that you will multiply and grow and be stronger, stronger. And when you multiply, what is that definition of? An overcomer. So that you will be an overcomer and overcome your afflictions. Whole book of Revelation written about guys like guys and girls like you folks. Overcomers. So that you will multiply and grow. That's your life right now. You're all suffering afflictions and terrible things happening. Happening to me. I got all kinds of problems going on. And I'm trying to overcome. Sometimes I don't make it. Sometimes I get defeated for a while, but then I come back. I stand up again. All right, so Jesus Christ, let me just get this off the air here for a second. Some foolish person. Jesus Christ said in John 3, 3. See, so either you want to be Go to heaven or you want to go to hell. Make your choice now. Here's a way. The Bible says God provides a way of escape. That's literally a way to escape. What is the way to escape? Jesus Christ. I don't know how to get to heaven, but Jesus does. And I want to follow him. And if you want to follow him, here's what, here's what, here's what Jesus said to a fellow named Nicodemus, who's a biblical authority. He said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In other words, you can't get to heaven without being born again. Well, the guy that he was talking to was a guy named Nicodemus. Nicodemus had no idea. He said, I don't know what's going on here, but you know, how can a guy come out of his mother's womb again a second time? See, he was looking at physically, naturally, not spiritually. Well, what does that mean, being born again? Uh, Romans 10, 9 says this. This is how it, what it means. It means that if thou wilt confess with thy mouth, Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Now, if, God, if you believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, what that means is you have accepted the fact that Jesus Christ died to pay the penalty for your sins and was resurrected. That's what that means. If you say with your mouth, that means say it orally. God wants you to articulate the words, because up here, there are no words. There are only thoughts. So you can say things in your head all day long, ain't going to get you no place. That's not what God wants. He's, he wants you to articulate, say it, because what happens is your, your thoughts have to get together and decide to say these words. This is the decision God wants. So he says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Saved means born again. Saved from what? <laughs> what do you mean saved from what? Man, saved from <laughs> what's coming? What's staring you in the face? Literally staring in the face. It's about to happen. Doesn't mean today, tomorrow, I don't know. Doesn't mean next week, I don't know. Next month, oh, I don't know about next month. That's kind of far away. It means soon. It's about to happen. You better get ready to meet your maker. Because you're going to meet him. And you, when you meet him, you're going to be an overcomer going up instead of a <laughs> going down. Because there are no second chances then. The decision is done. Those who are, are evil will remain evil still. So I asked down here, is there anybody here today who for the first time would like to receive Jesus Christ, say this prayer to receive Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Now, I say that because there also are, uh, it's a questionable situation. I've said this uh, uh, offer many, many times to, to, to let's say, one guy, say, to, to a guy named Sam, okay? And uh, just for example, and, and Sam said, always said the prayer, but he didn't get saved. But then the last time he said the prayer, which was the 976th time, 
all of a sudden he got saved. The word came into him and it went down into his heart and started. And Jesus took root in his heart. See? So I don't know what you are. But anybody here would like to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? Would you raise your hand for the first time? Please raise your hand. No Christian. No, you already have done that. That's fine. Thank you, sir. Okay. That's, that's uh, Terry William, who's already received Jesus Christ a couple week or two weeks ago. Okay, and that's good. He wants to make sure, right, Terry? Okay, you know, I'm pretty sure a lot of people here would like to make sure, wouldn't they? How do you make sure? <coughs> Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. I've said this thousands of times. Thousands of times. It doesn't make me any more righteous than you. Once it'll make me righteous is righteous. You don't get more righteous than me. Or less righteous to me. Righteous is righteous. You want to get saved? You want to go to heaven? Let's all rise, please, and say this prayer. And this is for the internet congregation as well. They can receive they can receive Jesus their Lord and Savior. And if you're sitting down someplace and I just ask you to rise, please rise. I mean I can't see you, but God's watching. You're either going to obey or disobey. If you disobey the first command, then you're not going to get saved. So if it's possible, please rise and say this prayer with me. And this is going out to all the world right now, every world in, in every every uh, country in the world. And we'll be 24-7 from here until the end. Let's say this now, shall we? As a chorus of heavenly angels is what we are. Most of us, if not all, are returning, being restored back into heaven. Thank you, Lord. We're overcomers being restored. Thank you, Lord. Father God. Father God. Father God. I confess I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid the penalty for all my sins and was resurrected. Thank you, Lord. Father God, please send your son, your seed, your love, your fire into my heart. To be, to be the Lord and Savior, and Savior of, my of my life. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God. Amen. 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 Proud. Please be seated. God bless you. Let's hear. Wow, well, we can do better than that. That's good. Okay, we're going to take tithes and offerings now. I want uh, uh, you gentlemen to sit down for uh, for a minute. Do we take tithes and offerings? Okay. Uh, I need. Uh, I have to select the ties. I, I have to select the people. I have a reason for doing that. You two back here, both come up and take ties and offerings from me. Don't go away, little man. I have, a I have something for you to do too. Now, we're taking ties and offerings now. Why are we doing ties and offerings? I mean, you've got a bunch of poor people here. Mostly poor people are, are here. I'd say 99% of us are, okay? So why, why are we taking tithes and offering, taking money from you? Well, <laughs> it isn't taking from you. I want to give you, because God says he will give you. He, what he's looking for is you to overcome your love of money. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. He wants you to overcome your love of money and love him instead. So that means you've got to take away from your love of money and give it to God who you put above your money. Now, if you're able to do that, God says, I will open the windows of heaven above you so that I will bless you so that you can't take the blessings. You can't, they will run off, run off you. There'll be so, so many blessings, okay? So what we're, that's why we're doing this. And we're also doing this so you can get an understanding of who you are. I don't know who you are. I don't know who tithes and who doesn't tithe, okay? Doesn't mean that you can't go to heaven if you don't tithe. No, it doesn't mean that. Just means that you're being disobedient. And they're disobedient in heaven too. They mow, they mow lawns and things like that uh, for all eternity. <laughs> and they, <laughs> but if you want to have some responsibility in heaven, you need to obey, uh, obey God. That means you need to follow what he's teaching. All right? The responsibility is there will be people ruling five cities and ruling ten cities and ruling ten planets and one galaxy and all this kind of stuff's going on because we're going out into the universe to preach the gospel to every creature. It's up to you. And that's what the tithes are for. It's a testimony of your belief in God. If you tithe, you believe God. 
if you don't tithe, what God said is this. This is a quote in Malachi, same place. Would you rob God? Ooh. So in other words, when you meet God, he's going to say, would you, you don't tithe, would you rob God? And then people say, well, what do you mean rob God? In tithes and offerings, he said, would you rob, the, rob send, your, send your money to the storehouse. That's the place for the food and clothing. That's us. Okay. This is a big deal. I just told you today a big deal. This, this message... I don't know, something happened to the dog, but he's, he survived. Okay, let's pay attention. This is a big deal here, what we, we talked about today. I have your attention. If the dog's too much for you, you can leave with the dog. You foolish people. This is what you should be paying attention to. Dog will live. You may not. What's wrong with you? Don't you understand what's going on? How many times do I have to tell you? Time after time. And you still don't get it. I shouldn't. Uh, God forgive me for being angry. God forgive me for being angry. I should have pity. Jesus didn't be. A, he wasn't angry when he did the same thing, telling all the people all the time. He didn't get angry. He just had pity on them. He wept. Wept. W E P T. Jesus wept. Because he knew. Where are you going to go? And you don't. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you for blessing us and saving us and loving us. And Lord, please forgive me again for getting out of line and out of order. Uh, I just... Please forgive me. I bless these people, Lord, every person here, with more of you. If they're willing to receive it, more of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. One more thing before we go. Okay. Time for you to come forward here and say a prayer for the food we're about to Come on forward, I said. Okay. Say a prayer for the food we're about to You can, that's not that close. <laughs> okay. That's good. That's good right there. A little more. Okay. It's fine. I'm kidding. Father God, I want to thank you for uh, Reverend and giving us that, that great sermon today. Uh, I want to thank the guys in the kitchen for the hands they have that make the great food that we're going to feed everyone with today. Father God, in your name, I pray that everyone gets along and uh, overseas. Uh, I really hope that that uh, tyrant uh, changes his mind and stops destroying those people. And just give us our daily bread. And, uh, in your name, I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless God. I hope to see We're going to eat now. I hope to see you next week. Bring people, if we're still around next week. I don't know anymore.